Around the turn of the 20th century, Nikola Tesla was hard at work with Thomas Edison on the wireless projection of alternating current electrical power. But Edison was heavily invested in non-alternating current, so he and Tesla had a falling out, and Tesla went to Long Island to work on a very large transmission tower. Around the same time, the Golden Dawn a latter-day offshoot of the Theosophical Society of Madame Blavatsky, were experimenting with psychic flying roles or the use of will through ritual to project the light body into various other realms of perception, which included early precursors of remote viewing. The goal was to maintain contact with the secret chiefs who supposedly had once existed on this physical plane, but had long since transcended to the astral realm. Tesla soon lost funding for his Long Island Tower and may have lost his mind around the same time. He did not refute claims that his technology had military applications, perhaps courting military funding for his projects, and these accusations included blaming him for the enormous blast which occurred in Siberia near Tunguska. Ten years later, when an expedition was finally sent to investigate this blast, no comet impact crater or nuclear-type blast radius could be found. Instead, the trees for as many as a hundred miles around had been flattened, but those at the epicenter were still erect. This has led to the explanation that an above-ground explosion occurred, and one of the most outlandish theories for this has speculated that a matter and antimatter particle collided there, though no explanation has been tendered as to how or why this would have occurred. The same result could, according to relativity of matter energy, have been produced by a large burst of electrical energy. In the 40s, Dr. Albert Hoffman was given permission to recreate his earlier chemical extrapolation of the hallucinogenic properties of ergot, a wheat mold. The result, LSD-25, was rarefied in Switzerland and large quantities were purchased by I.G. Farben. One of the executives of Farben, a German-American company that operated outside of the World War II embargo with government funding, was Alan Dulles, and he may have shipped the supplies purchased from the Swiss Sandoz Laboratory to the nearby Austrian Dachau concentration camp, which was a large purchaser of chemical weapons supplied largely, if not exclusively, by I.G. Farben. After the end of the war, Farben was dissolved into many smaller companies based on the technologies that it experimented with during the war. One of these would become IBM. Another would become Bayer Medicine. Dulles would go on to become the first head of the CIA after it was renamed by Truman from the Office of Strategic Services, OSS. Dulles oversaw Project Paperclip, the now well-known operation by CIA and MI5 operatives to secure Nazi scientists after the end of the German offensive. Some of these scientists would be brought back to America to work on the atomic bomb project, and some would be integrated into the formative staff of NASA. Others were captured by the Soviets and used subsequently to perform experiments in their equivalent programs. During the late 40s and early 50s, the CIA initiated Project MK Ultra, which began as an experiment to find a reliable truth serum for use in interrogation. It rapidly erupted into a full-fledged pharmacological application experiment into the study of mind control in general. Dulles, who was well aware of LSD-25 by that time, highly recommended it for usage, and the experiments on enlisted men and women, prisoners and psychiatric patients, and, ultimately, on students and other ordinary citizens as well, proceeded apace. At the same time, the Russians were experimenting heavily with similar mind control techniques, 
though their own research focused largely on psychokinesis and telepathy rather than on chemical induction of post-hypnotic suggestibility. By the late 60s and early 70s, MKUltra had changed its name to MK Search, and most of the MKUltra documents were destroyed by then-CIA director Richard Helms. Supposedly, the drug experimentation of MKUltra in the early 50s had given way, by the 60s, to experiments in cooperation with civilian scientists, such as Jose Delgado and Louis West, on the use of technological machinery to induce similar alterations in states of consciousness. Some of the products of this era were non-lethal weapons based in large part on Tesla's designs to be used for crowd control. At this time, the Russians started Project Woodpecker, projecting a brainwave resonant frequency at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. By 1977, the signal, powered by the nuclear reactor at Chernobyl, may have gone global. Around this same time, the United States and Soviet Union were also experimenting with zero-point energy technology, based in part on Tesla's scalar wave technology, and partially on the hovercraft technology designed by the Third Reich. The public culmination of this technology is the stealth aircraft technology. However, many researchers have speculated that a secret arm of this development program has continued through to today in the form of time travel technology experimented with at Montauk, Long Island. Nowadays, the technology of psychic entrainment has become largely corporate. The machines originally devised by the U.S. and USSR governments have become available in the form of brainwave generating music and light goggles, and the practice of remote viewing, such as the U.S. Project Stargate, has been publicly subcontracted, and much of its data is available under the Freedom of Information Act. The Cold War project, meant as a reaction to Project Woodpecker, was Project Harp. However, since the end of the Cold War, this technology too has been donated to the education department of its respective state and is being applied to non-military research. Concurrent to this writing. However, this is no longer the case. The process of astral travel largely developed by the Golden Dawn's applications of the Theosophical Society's ideas has become nearly synonymous with remote viewing through subsequent experiments and programs and is now taught quite openly to the public by government-funded corporate organizations. Who knows what applications of these experiments and this technology the 21st century will bring. I encourage you all to use the resources available to us all to as thoroughly investigate these matters as possible and as interest you, and I will be around to answer any questions you have as best I can. To begin with, I think we should look at certain assassins, such as Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby, Sirhan Sirhan, Mark David Chapman, Charles Manson, as well as the killers of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. I realize these are, for me, all homegrown assassins, and that this list could easily be expanded to include not only successful assassins, but also attempted ones, such as the man who shot Ronald Reagan, and assassins, successful or unsuccessful, from foreign countries, such as the assassin of Archduke Ferdinand, which began World War I. Perhaps if someone is reading this, another researcher could comment on at least some of these who I may have excluded or missed. By now, we are all relatively aware of the facts involving many of these assassins, such as Oswald, Ruby, Sirhan Sirhan, Chapman, Manson, etc., and I should hope that, by now at least, we may be free to believe that they may have been directed to commit these assassinations by some higher-order force which orchestrated their movements and which directly commanded them to take these actions. So now, I would like to speculate, was this force a real one, 
or simply in their heads. In the case of Lee Harvey Oswald, as well as Jack Ruby, the majority of, at least, informed Americans believes that there was, in fact, a higher order force which was responsible for controlling these assassins. These informed citizens often believe that there is an elite cabal of very powerful interested parties involved in the handling of these particular assassins. In their minds, further, it can therefore be extended from these two isolated trigger men to include responsibility for, virtually, if not, all the others I have mentioned, as far back as even including not only the assassin of the Archduke, but even, it would sometimes seem, John Wilkes Booth as well. So the question becomes, whether this suspicion of a conspiracy is viable or not, who or what could have coerced the trigger men, how and why could they have been coerced, when and where did this coercion occur? Is it possible that the belief in a conspiracy itself was responsible for causing these assassins to pull the trigger? So, with this in mind, let us return to the facts surrounding each of these garden variety assassins' exposure to top-level, highly classified information which would lead them to believe in a conspiracy and answer these questions about how they gained access to it and how it may have affected their beliefs leading up to their becoming assassins, and most importantly, why it would have driven them to commit this end in particular. Lee Harvey Oswald has been tied to mafia gangster, hustler, card shark, pimp, and bagman Jack Ruby in multiple sources, so we do not need to overburden their connection here. Suffice it for our purposes in this exposition to propose a rather obvious fact that is often overlooked, that Jack Ruby was, among other things relative to him, probably also Lee Harvey Oswald's personal weed dealer. However, before we can even begin to get into this connection, which we won't, by the way, it is necessary to turn the clock back even further to find Oswald's first encounter with mind-altering psychoactives. It was in early 1958 that the CIA, through Project MKUltra, became the overseer of military intelligence experiments using LSD-25 to induce post-hypnotic suggestion effects to counter foreign insurgent interrogation techniques. In 58, the CIA oversaw a Project Artichoke test at the Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland, USA. During these tests, LSD-25, which the Army had codenamed EA-1729, was tested on several American and enlisted men to ascertain a variety of different possible applications. However, this was already after the CIA had performed several independent tests with LSD on American volunteer civilians in covert front organizations, such as at UCLA at Berkeley and in various Western U.S. mental hospitals. In fact, the LSD experimentation by the CIA dates back at least as early as April 13, 1953, when Project MKUltra was put into effect. Therefore, it is also possible that the Office of Naval Intelligence was on to the experimental effects of this psychoactive chemical substance for some time before the Edgewood Arsenal tests as well. Oswald as a young radar operator enlisted in the United States military, was stationed at El Toro Marine Base in Atsugi, Japan, from September 1957. As a pro-Marxist Leninist, it was somewhat peculiar for Oswald to have garnered this position, as it involved tracking via radar the takeoffs and landings of the important U-2 spy plane missions over Russia, which were so instrumental in determining the bomber gap during the early years of the Cold War between the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. Now, at Atsugi, 
Oswald was listed in the medical records as having contracted gonorrhea in the line of duty, not due to own personal misconduct. As an early espionage agent investigating the Soviet spy hostess of the Queen Bee brothel. So it should not be surprising that, in May or June of 1959, he, his friend Carrie Thornley, and Oswald's partner in a loan sharking operation, Bucknell Beaver, were approached as potential recruitments to an espionage program to infiltrate the new Castro regime in Cuba before Castro had declared his communist sympathies and ascertained the potential presence of Soviet espionage agents close to the new president of Cuba. The Hispanic civilian who approached the three for this mission, as pro-communists, was an officer of the Joint Technical Advisory Group, whose building, main side, was located just next door to El Toro. According to some researchers, the Joint Technical Advisory Group was a paramilitary co-op with the CIA for the express purpose of conducting tests using LSD on soldiers. It is known that, at least as early as from August to November of 1962, Project Artichoke was conducting experiments using EA-1729 in the Far East to test the effect of the drug in field interrogations. This sub-project of MKUltra, known as Project Derby Hat, may have been Oswald's first exposure to a psychoactive substance which could induce post-hypnotic suggestions and was, overtly at that time, being tested for purposes of direct mind control. But it would certainly not be his last with such means and motives. According to at least two researchers into the mysterious life of humble, leftist radio operator Lee Oswald, after Oswald's prominent defection to the USSR, Oswald may have received a brain implant device meant to control his mind. Oswald's defection to the USSR, shortly after his service at El Toro as radar operator supervising the reconnaissance of the U-2 spy plane flights over the USSR, has been blamed by many outspoken officials in the U.S. government military, and intelligence communities for the loss over Russia of the final U-2 spy plane mission flown by Francis Gary Powers, which would ultimately lead to the collapse of the Kennedy-Khrushchev peace summit the following summer. In 1964, following President Kennedy's assassination, CIA Director McCone wrote a classified document, recently released, to Secret Service Director James Rowley, stating his admission that Oswald had been chemically or electronically controlled and had acted as a sleeper agent. The memo cites Oswald's having spent 11 days at an ear, nose, and throat clinic in Minsk for a minor ailment, an ear infection. The speculation implied by this was that Oswald had been sedated and altered in some way. The most likely conclusion, however unlikely it may seem, involves a fellow contemporary defector of Oswald's, Robert E. Webster. Webster had attended a trade exhibition at Moscow with the Rand Development Corporation and was escorted by two Rand executives when he defected. Henry Rand and George Bookbinder, both of whom were former members of the OSS. The Rand Corporation had, as early as 1949, released a report on Soviet hypnosis experiments, proposed an American counteroffensive, and were already heavily involved in mind control experimentation. Both Webster and Oswald would eventually return to the United States after their defections implying that they had been acting as covert espionage agents for the U.S. or other interested parties, Webster's return having been eased by affidavits from Rand. Afterwards, Oswald inquired into Webster's well-being 
when returning to the U.S. himself, indicating that they had met either in the States before their defection or possibly abroad while in the USSR. The trade conference in Moscow, which Webster had attended on behalf of Rand, was part of the International House World Trade Center, which at that time was under the directorship of former OSS liaison to Winston Churchill during World War II and Project Paperclip operations agent Clay Shaw. On March 16, 1967, Perry Raymond Russo testified to Jim Garrison under oath in a district court panel criminal investigation into the death of JFK that he had been present at a meeting between Clay Shaw, David Ferry, and a man calling himself Leon Oswald, who was probably only a private investigator named William Seymour, working for Double Check PI firm, supposedly a front for CIA activities in New Orleans. Immediately prior to the assassination of JFK in 1963, there was a top-secret meeting at the trial compound in Jamaica, owned by Sir William Stevenson, Britain's top intelligence agent. At this meeting were Major Lewis Mortimer Bloomfield, for the British Special Operations Executive, in charge of infiltrating American intelligence agencies. Ferenc Nagay, a past cabinet minister of the pro-Nazi Horthy Party of Hungary, George Mandel, trade minister for Mussolini, two white Russian emigres, Jean de Menil, and Paul Rygorodsky, as well as Colonel Clay Shaw of the OSS. The subject of both of these meetings discussion was the assassination of then U.S. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I've talked before about how man-made background EMF radiation can be received through the current charged human nervous system, and in particular by the receptive electrochemical dynamo of the brain. For a brief recap of some of the primary concerns to this effect, reference the ELF rays used by the HARP antenna array and compare these with the Cold War era Soviet woodpecker signals, whose stated objective was to brainwash the citizens of the U.S. The concern of many researchers into the subject of microwave and ELF is that these inaudible, though obviously detectable frequencies can be used for the purpose of mind control. However, all sources of authority on this issue maintain claims that the use of these frequencies by state agencies and commercial industries is entirely benign and harmless. Quote, For most of the 20th century, the radio frequency 500 kilohertz was reserved worldwide as the Morse Code International Calling and Distress Frequency for ships on the high seas. The frequency 2182 kHz is still used for this purpose, but employing voice transmission. End quote. Obviously, Wikipedia is dutifully reporting that, although originally designed for use in transmitting sensitive data through coded channels during wartime, the ELF frequency stations are currently being employed for the more modern method of voice transmission. Quote, the BBC has always denied any involvement, and in the book you will read of a denial of the use of the frequency 6,840 kilohertz. We have not used it for many years. However, later on came the following reply from BFBS, Thank you for your letter inquiring about our 6,840 kilohertz frequency and any associated interference. You may or may not know that this frequency was lent to us in order that British forces serving in the Gulf area could keep in touch with not only the British news, but also service news via BFBS. 
End quote. Simon Mason. Secret Signals. If the ELF stations were being used solely for British and service news broadcasts to troops far abroad, then why would it be necessary to deny its being used at all? Is it possible that these otherwise innocuous channels of communication are continuing to be used for clandestine or even espionage purposes? It would certainly seem they are serving some sort of sinister ends, as they are present not only in Great Britain but also in the U.S., Russia, and even China. But what exactly are the voice transmissions on these contraband channels saying that raises such alarm and concern among their citizen watchdog ham radio operating listeners? These so-called shortwave numbers stations are transmitting numbers. Quote, at five minutes past the hour, there was a pause, and the woman said, Octung. And then the first heading was sent again, but this time the 05 was replaced by the number of five figure groups in the message. For example, 343242 meant that 22 five figure groups were in message 34324. End quote. Secret Signals, Simon Mason. So now we can draw an allusion towards a real palpable conclusion regarding this enigma of sub-radio broadcasting and see also the implications of its use on the minds, even the very brains themselves, of the unwitting and uninformed people exposed every hour on the hour to these voice transmissions from numbers stations. From pages 529 and 530 of the Illuminati formula used to create an undetectable total mind-controlled slave by Cisco Wheeler and Fritz Sprigmeier comes this table of contents for only some of the Monarch MK code types recovered under depth hypnosis. So, for example, under Omega Coding, we find the following listing of trigger codes. I chose these coding systems because they are exclusively numeric. Confer page 533. While most of the other codes listed in Sprigmeyer, pages 529 on, are either verbal or a combination of words and numbers. Quote, Psi is a term from parapsychology derived from the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet, from the Greek psyche, mind, or soul. The term was coined by biologist Berthold P. Wisner and first used by psychologist Robert Thaulis in a 1942 article published in the British Journal of Psychology. Definition a term used to demarcate processes or effects associated with cognitive or physiological activity that fall outside of conventional scientific boundaries. For example, extrasensory perception. Traditionally, the term has had two subcategories, psi gamma, pertaining to paranormal cognition, ESP, remote viewing, etc., and Psi Kappa, pertaining to paranormal action, psychokinesis, etc. End quote. The great question involved in Psi research is whether precognitively knowing something will happen is tantamount to having actively participated in causing it to have occurred. For example, the difference between knowing a traffic light has changed while not looking at it 
and having caused the traffic light to change by thinking about it. Thus, the distinction between Psi Gamma, remote viewing, and Psi Kappa, remote influencing, should not be taken lightly. Quote, remote viewing, RV, refers to the attempt to gather information about a distant or unseen target using paranormal means or extrasensory perception. Typically, a remote viewer is expected to give information about an object that is hidden from physical view and separated at some distance. The term was introduced by parapsychologists Russell Targ and Harold Putoff in 1974. Remote viewing was popularized in the 1990s following the declassification of documents related to the Stargate Project, a $20 million research program sponsored by the U.S. federal government to determine any potential military application of psychic phenomenon. The program was terminated in 1995, citing a lack of documented evidence that the program had any value to the intelligence community. End quote. Why would the U.S. DOD, the American Military Industrial Complex, consider RV a viable enough resource to invest $20 million throughout the GHW Bush administration? Could it be because of the Reagan debriefing on Project Serpo? which would have come as no surprise to his successor, G.H.W. Bush, who had denied Reagan's predecessor, Jimmy Carter, access to the same information as head of the CIA under Carter? Quote, The Stargate Project created a set of protocols designed to make researching clairvoyance and out-of-body experiences more scientific and minimize as much as possible session noise and inaccuracy. The term remote viewing emerged as shorthand to describe this more structured approach to clairvoyance. Stargate only received a mission after all other intelligence attempts, methods, or approaches had already been exhausted. At its peak, Stargate had as many as 14 labs researching remote viewing. It was also reported that there were over 22 active military and domestic remote viewers providing data. In 1995, the project was transferred to the CIA, and a retrospective evaluation of the results was done. Time magazine stated in 1995, three full-time psychics were still working on a $500,000 a year budget out of Fort Meade, Maryland, which would soon close up shop. One was using tarot cards. End quote. Bear in mind, the termination of the Stargate project came one year following the beginning of Clinton's second term as G.H.W. Bush's successor as U.S. President, and two years following the primary crisis of his first term, the ATF and FBI siege on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. From what I've read by authors who had been involved with Project Stargate, they often mention their more controversial and more theoretical on-target hits, such as U.S. CIA collusion in the ignition of the oil reserves in Saudi Arabia, and the contamination of these fires with chemical, biological weapons, which resulted in Gulf War Syndrome among the veterans. However, statistically, the data supports that their hit-to-miss ratio as a group was only on-target about 20% of the time. In the work, Remote Viewing Secrets, by Joseph McMonigle, one of the original members of Project Stargate, brought on board by its originally commissioned founder, Ingo Swan, has compiled his own research on potential causes for the apparent discrepancy between the accuracy of their 20% on-target hits and their general apparent inability to accurately target about 80% of the time. He correlates the effects on their hit-to-miss ratio with the Earth's sidereal day, that is, the exact duration of a complete rotation of Earth on its axis, and their own location on the globe relative to the direction from Earth of galactic core. He found a strong positive correlation between the rising and noon of the sidereal day 
relative to galactic core with the accuracy of the Stargate project team's hits, and between the waning and midnight positions of Galactic Core relative to their position on Earth, with the inaccuracy of the team's misses. However, while addressing the legitimate and most recently declassified DoD military projects of the recent past by examining Project Stargate is important, we must also not forget that this project was under the same jurisdiction as, provably, the earliest MK Delta tests on soldiers and pilots in the early 1960s, and, supposedly, as the Montauk Project under Camp Hero in New York. Just as MK Delta, later called MK Ultra, was a military project first that had been handed over to the CIA, so too, was Project Stargate originally under the DoD, then transferred to CIA. Just as MK Delta dealt with finding the ultimate truth serum and Stargate, like Operation Dove and MK Ultra itself, operated on the scientific method of applying these drugs to the creation of technology, so too, at the same time as Stargate, was Montauk already applying the technology recovered at Roswell and exchanged with Serpo.